Thanks, everyone. And it's a distinct honor to be here giving this presentation in front of you. And I thank the organizers for inviting me to present. Um, I'm going to give an overview that will touch on this topic, but I'll take a few liberties. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, my co-author, Andy Shepard, who some of you may know uh, through your collaborations with him. Um, this is just a general outline of what I'm going to touch upon. I'm going to focus a little bit on um, government perceptions, but through the, through the, through the lens of um, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, recent assessment of invasive alien species, and some of the key messages contained within that um, that give us some reflections um, on government perceptions of biological control and government perceptions of tools for invasive species management more generally. Um, this key assessment, global assessment, not only um, outlines the scale of the challenge, but also some of the things that we have to work on. So that's what I'll do in the opening part of my talk, um, and then proceed to share some reflections and hopefully some connections with the other talks that we've heard today um, to, to bring home some messages around biological control and how it could address societal issues um, and how we can manage the regulatory challenges to ensure we provide sustainable solutions into the future. So as I mentioned, um, the IPBES report, um, which as I outlined was the intergovernmental panel, uh, intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, conducted this quite thorough and extensive um, assessment of the scale of the challenge of invasive alien species and what we have to do in the context of their management. Um, and also outlined through that the urgent need for sustained and sustainable collective action to address the problem of invasive alien species. So invasive alien species are organisms introduced by humans um, into new regions, as we have already heard in other talks, that go on to establish and spread and have impacts on nature and people. They are among the five most important drivers of global biodiversity loss. People and nature continue to be collectively threatened by invasive alien species across all parts of the globe. This map here outlines um, the extent of the invasive species threat. Very few regions of the world have not been colonized by invasive alien species. More than just being a geographical problem, it is also a temporal problem. Just about every taxonomic group we look at, um, the threats of biological invasions are increasing, and they're increasing across all the geographic regions of the world. The impacts of invasive alien species range from causing extinctions. They've contributed in some form or the other to some 60% of the global extinction. Um, they have inc they create increased economic costs and go on to have negative impacts on food security, water security, human health, and cultural values, as we've heard so eloquently explained through the different framings that are helping us understand and manage invasive mm -hmm. species. The impacts of invasive alien species are global, evident across continents, across landscapes, and across ecosystems. Invasive species disproportionately affect those people with the greatest dependence on nature. This includes indigenous peoples of the world and subsistence landholders. I don't think this is lost on anybody in this room, but I think it's worth re-emphasizing that this is where the brunt of many of the challenges are born. And I think Chris's talk earlier started to highlight um, what, how we might have to think about how we address these challenges for these groups that are often most significantly affected. Now, people are at the heart of the problem of invasive alien species. Trade and travel, uh, especially illegal trade, that facilitates the transportation, introduction, and establishment um, of invasive alien species are a big part of the problem. Um, but there are varying human values and behavior that influence invasive alien species getting moved around the world, and it's important to understand um, those dimensions. I think, again, Chris did a great job of outlining some of that. 
Um, and, the, and the global travel, global travel and trade are um, going to be causative factors of species invasions that are going to increase and forecasted to increase over time. Now, fortunately, people are also at the heart of the solution. I think Chris, Chris outlined the importance of taking that systems perspective that brings in um, not just the landholders, but also the broader community into the, into the frame. There are a range of effective management solutions available, and biological control is central to that. And I think we need to, we need to keep that in mind based on the talks that we've heard today and the broader literature on biological control. There's also detailed knowledge and experience that sit locally, that sit nationally, uh, and internationally in support of effective management. We heard from Lindley Hayes, that out, um, who outlined how through the Pacific, the combination of Western science and indigenous knowledge um, can really be a valuable asset in effective invasive species management. There's great potential to manage invasive species at the landscape sc scale through solutions like biological control. Now, biological invasions can be thought of, and we've seen this invasion continuum in a few presentations uh, today. There are effective, um, the invasion continuum spans um, from when an invasive alien species is absent in a country or location through to when it gets introduced, establishes self-sustaining populations before becoming widespread and having significant impacts. There are distinct management actions that countries can take to manage invasive species at each step along the pathway, but biological control and integrated management, especially taking some of the systems approaches that we've started to hear about, can help across much of the invasion continuum, and we need to be aware of that. The IPBES assessment found that biological control has an important role to play in the long-term landscape scale invasive species management that's needed across the, across the invasion continuum and across many different ecosystems. The best assessment also unfortunately found that the challenge for invasive species management and biological control is the level of policy support that underpins and enables it. And we've heard some talks today that are really heartening around how those policy frameworks are starting to get established and it would be really important to continue to strengthen them moving forward. Unfortunately, even though some 80% of countries have targets for invasive alien species management within their biodiversity strategies, um, some 83% of them lack the legislation or the regulative fr regulatory framework to help manage them. This is a key challenge. As a result, nearly half the countries do not invest in invasive alien species management, which is a major challenge. Effective policies enabling invasive alien species management, including through biological control, is therefore an urgent need. Given all of this, what are some of the challenges to managing government and societal perceptions of biological control as a key tool in invasive alien species management? Unfortunately, there is a growing risk aversion in many pockets of the world. This is influenced in part by different lobby groups, an incorrect use or interpretation of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle does not stop action in the face of managing a significant threat in the, ab in the presence of an uncertainty. It actually encourages managing the threat despite the uncertainty in that context. And I think it needs to be thought through in that framework. There's also the perceived risk to threaten species from biological control, which needs to be understood and discussed and resolved, and influence of changing societal values on legislation, and of course, as Lindley eloquently outlined in her talk, as did Harriet, communication remains a challenge. We've got to keep communicating, communicating, communicating. Some of this creates significant challenges for public acceptability. To address the public acceptability challenges, we need to understand when more science will address the concerns and when they won't. Science is essential, but not sufficient. We need to be able to engage more broadly um, than just stand on our data. Um, we need to be able to work with people 
and as Lindley pointed out in her talk, find out who are the decision makers and key influencers in the system who we can support to arrive at meaningful decision for invasive species management. Um, we need to publicly discuss the issues, including with, especially with, our critics in both an evidence-based manner, um, but also to disentangle why people are getting emotional about the things they're getting emotional about and bring them towards more rational courses of action. We need to document and communicate our successes, not just directly as scientists, but through the beneficiaries of biological control. Um, it was uh, an excellent engagement from the audience in response to the cabby presentation on the hibiscus mealy, uh, on the papaya mealybug story from Kenya and Ugandan delegates in the, in the audience where you brought to life how your lived experience of utilizing the biological control assisted landholders in management. You are the effective advocates, not the scientists necessarily who did the work. And we need to lean on, on you to learn how to do that better. It's not all just about um, public acceptability and how we manage that. There is a significant regulatory challenge. Biological control risk analyses processes are poorly understood. And I'm really grateful to Rob in his earlier talk for outlining how the FO process and the standards set out within is helping clarify that um, more generally, both for the, for the European Union, but also as a way forward moving generally. Um, there is limited um, there is limited general policy or regulatory systems to support biocontrol adoption. But this can be improved through more streamlined regulation with a starting point perhaps that biological control is beneficial by design. We also need to address sometimes conflicting regulatory requirements that can be a hurdle to implementing safer plant protection options like biological control. And we need to embrace how some economic communities may see biological control um, less favorably, but how do we engage with them to bring them along on the journey towards sustainable management? It is important and worth repeating that biological control is an evidence-based and policy and regulation guided use of living organisms to mitigate the impacts of diseases, invertebrate and vertebrate pests, weeds and invasive alien species to provide social, economic, and environmental benefits. The table on the right-hand side um, shows that though we can do things to strengthen biological control regulation, this is just an illustration from a publication, from a recent publication in 2022 that shows how well-regulated biological control is for the various risks under consideration in comparison to a range of other species introductions for other economic or social or amenity benefits. So biological control has a lot going for it and I think we need to do more to strengthen it. So in, in conclusion, um, we have multiple sustainable development goals. We have strong international aspirations um, which are high, but our development, sustainable development goals can be greatly enabled by biological control. We've heard about the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Target six requires us to reduce the introduction of invasive alien species by 50% and minimize their impacts. And target seven aims to make reduction in the risk from pesticides at least half what it currently is by 2030. Biological control is a key contributor to that. The FAO strategic framework requires this transformation of more efficient, transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. Biological control, yet again, has a role to play in that. WHO's One Health Initiative, as has been outlined already by Urs, it's been taken up by many countries and requires adopting sustainable practices that recognize that human health is intrinsically tied to plant health, animal health, and environmental health. Biological control has a role to play in that. The IUCN's global standards for nature-based solutions have eight criteria, almost all of which will be aided 
by biological control. So it's heartening to see various jurisdictions, including the European Union, start to increasingly recognize the importance of biocontrol. The EU recently, uh, as evident by the mission letter to the Commissioner Delegate for Health and Animal Welfare and the strategic dialogues being facilitated by the Commissioner Designate for Agriculture and Food, uh, are talking more and more about using and implementing biological control in the EU, and hopefully that's a trend that's broader. So in conclusion, I will just encourage you all, perhaps as your head hits the pillow tonight after a long and stimulating set of talks, to imagine what we could achieve to address all these lofty global and national aspirations by combining legislative and regulatory curiosity and a 100 plus year track record of evidence-based biological control solutions that are both safe and sustainable. Thank you for your time.